Dear everyone, greetings from Asian Productivity Organization. Hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this pandemic. This is live from the APO Secretary Office in Tokyo, Japan, and we welcome all our viewers from APO member countries and beyond. I am Asai Tambi Monikam, and thanks to our viewers for joining us on this APO Productivity Talk series. And today we will discuss about smart agriculture transformation and productivity. Smart agriculture offers a great potential for continued agriculture transformation for developing Asia by using IoT, AI, drones, and big data. And countries like Japan had already started reaping the benefits of these technologies for productivity increase in agriculture. But in Asia, we have many developing and underdeveloping countries, and they are not in a position to adopt readily all types of innovation out there due to those countries' readiness level. So in 2019, APO initiated and completed the research on smart agriculture transformation. We call it a SAT program to assess member economies SAT readiness and their needs for digital transformation in agriculture and assist member governments in development of comprehensive national SAT plans from selected APO member countries like India, Pakistan, Thailand, Indonesia, Republic of China, and Vietnam. By appointing a national expert from each country with two chief experts from ROC and Philippines. Today, we shall discuss the outcome and finding of that research program and for that, I am honored to welcome to one of our chief experts, Dr. Rohel from Philippines Institute for Development Studies, Manila. How are you today, Dr. Rohel? I'm fine, thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we get into further detailed discussion on the topic, let me share a video clip from Israel on how Israeli technologies are making agriculture more efficient and sustainable. Have a look. So agriculture has been around for what, 12,000 years? But did you know that today there are robots that can pick fruit and sensors that know what a plant wants and when? Here are seven Israeli technologies that are making farming more efficient and more sustainable. Nitzafim is famous for inventing drip irrigation, a system which drips water directly into plant roots. It significantly reduces water and increases crop yields. Today, they offer sustainable turnkey projects that include high-tech greenhouses and advanced control and monitoring open platform. This open platform wraps up 50 years of experience, put it up in the cloud, use this big data in order to serve every farmer worldwide. Israel recycles over 86% of its wastewater, by far the highest in the world. The Shafdan treatment plant takes raw sewage, filters it, filters it again with microorganisms, and cleans it until it is safe to drink. Tyrannus is an intelligence platform that uses satellite imagery, aerial footage, big data, and predictive analytics to monitor fields and help farmers make the best decisions. We can image a field in a really, really high resolution, about 0.1 millimeter per pixel. Wow. That means that we can see a tiny insect on a leaf, and then we can train a computer to analyze it and find these insects or weeds or disease, and give the farmer a report, and then he can spray according to this report just uh, where in his field we can find the weeds. He can by spraying just there. BioB uses predatory wasps to control insects as a biopesticide. It thereby reduces the need for chemical pesticides by up to 70%. Groundwork BioAd uses tiny microscopic fungi to help plant roots absorb more nutrients. This increases crop yield with less fertilizer. So the fungus uh, penetrates the plant root. It effectively extends that root in an underground web. The fungus can break down nutrients that are otherwise unavailable to the plant and physically mobilize them into the plant. FF Robotics makes robots with computer vision that can actually pick fruits straight off the trees. 
plant uses big data and sensors to talk with plants to know exactly what nutrients they need and when they need to be watered. With more people on the planet, we need to grow more food with less water and smarter, cleaner processes. This is the next agriculture revolution right here in Israel. As you have seen, the digital technologies like IoT and artificial intelligence are coming to wider use in many agriculture countries to spread sustainable farming and increase productivity. This is just simple example from Israeli technologies, but the technologies are evolving in most of the countries and now farmers started using and in similar way, the digital technologies, including internet, mobile technologies and devices Data analytics, digitally delivered services, and apps are changing agriculture and the food ecosystem. Digital technologies can also help governments to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of existing policies and programs and to design better ones. Before I invite Dr. Royal to start his presentation, we would like to encourage all our viewers to send your questions and comments in the chat box with your name and country, and we would respond to your questions. Dr. Rohel, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asai. Let me share my presentation. So I hope you can all see my first slide. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I would like to thank the Asian Productivity Organization for this privilege of being able to talk to you about smart agricultural transformation. And indeed, um, appointing me as one of the uh, chief agricultural experts uh, who helped coordinate uh, this activity. I am from the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. The talk will proceed in the following parts. Now, I think I'll give a little bit more background considering our audience uh, some might be from agriculture, but not so familiar with smart technologies. Smart, some might have be very uh, well-versed in digital technology, but not so much agriculture. So here we combine the two in smart agricultural transformation. I'll talk to you about the method of the research. So we did not invent a new agricultural uh, smart technology for this study, but rather we thought about how to accelerate the um, adoption of smart agricultural technologies for agricultural productivity of Asia. In doing that research, we came up with some findings, and this talk will be, I believe, the first public presentation of those findings. So you are a privileged first, dear audience. And finally, we conclude with some summary and recommendations coming from the study. So as discussed in the video, the world needs to be able to do agriculture in a way that is more sustainable and will economize on scarce resources. Asia is not exempt from this. In fact, Asia is 60% of the world's population. And if you think of rising global demand for food, a lot of that global demand will be coming from Asia. Not only that, but also the people of Asia are becoming more affluent led by the rapid growth, big superstars of China and India. So, but also throughout Asia are countries with large populations, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines, Indonesia. So all of these, you can see an evolution of a middle class. So not only will they demand more food, they will demand better quality food and food that complies with high safety standards. So no more of your traditional, say, slaughter shop or slaughterhouse. They want very precisely, uh, you know, uh, hum humanely slaughtered food that uh, observes the highest uh, hygiene standards. Now, how to make more food, safer and better food within the limited land and other resources of our planet? That is the big challenge in the next several decades. We argue in this study that there is an opportunity to help transition to this kind of agriculture through the adoption of smart trans, uh, agricultural technologies. In fact, 
what we call a smart agricultural transformation. You may heard, have heard of the term Industry 4.0, right? A new industrial revolution. Well, there is an Industry 4.0 as well for Asian agriculture, and we will talk about it today. The Asia Productivity Organization, as mentioned by ASAI, undertook this Smart Agricultural Transformation Program. So just to be able to make terms clear and people are not having different ideas when you use the term smart agriculture, we came up with a framework and the framework states the following. Smart agriculture is the use of new advanced technologies within the agri-food system to promote sustainable productivity by allowing farmers and other stakeholders to make more informed, appropriate decisions. So the video a while ago provided some real world examples of this uh, taking place involving utilization of big data. So data that is collected, say, from the fields could be from sensors. There, there's also big data emanating from remote sensing devices in satellites. And then using this information with all kinds of digital technologies to be able to support farmers in making more informed and appropriate de decisions. I would like to highlight that this includes the whole agri-food system. So from even the production of inputs for agriculture, such as seeds, fertilizers, uh, plant varieties, animal breeds, all this is part of smart agricultural transformation. If it uses some of the latest advances, especially in digital technologies, all the way down to the actual logistics and supply chain and distribution system, including food processing, so that the consumers will be able to receive hopefully more affordable food, safer food, and food that will meet their dietary needs, preferences, and tastes. Now, you might be thinking, oh, all of this is so fancy. No, even robots, how can we do that in Philippines, in Papua New Guinea? Well, I promise that the, the heading of smart agriculture is so broad that actually there are elements of these new technologies that can be very appropriate depending on the context. So we have this uh, in part as part of the framework for SAT, the recognition that the adoption of such smart technologies are very context specific. So in this program, this is involves several steps because APO is an organization that supports member countries uh, as seen in their organization name in improving productivity of their economies. So we have for this particular program, the following objectives. So you can read them there. But for this particular talk, let me zero in on the first one. It is to assess member economies, smart agricultural transformation readiness and their needs for digital transformation in agriculture. So you saw a while ago wondering, oh, how can there be robotics or this biofertilizer in my country? Since my country has so many small farmers, they're very poor and so on. Precisely, APO uh, could anticipate these questions and they have prepared this study, which is all about the readiness, the state of preparedness of the member countries for this smart agricultural transformation. So specifically, how did we pursue this research to answer the question about readiness for smart agricultural transformation? Here are some additional examples, by the way, which seem to indicate that there is a growing readiness within Asia. So we saw an example a while ago for Israel. This example came from one of our research studies for Indonesia. So you have here a case of uh, uh, unmanned aerial device or more properly uh, popularly called a drone. So without the need for a human exposing himself or her herself to harmful pesticides for application, the drone will be the one that will deliver the payload to the fields and in fact would be programmed to deliver it in a more precise manner rather than spraying, you know, wasting the chemical in an area where it's not needed. Given proper sensing devices, it can more narrowly focus its attention 
on the spot that, that needs uh, chemical application. Other examples are um, more controlled farming environments, such as in greenhouses, where in fact some of the process could even be highly automated. In livestock farming, so aside from crops, even for the growing of uh, uh, cows and uh, uh, swine, no, in countries where swine is grown, we are, there's now a worldwide uh, zoonotic pandemic of the African swine fever. So even more and more as these threats to the health of our animals begin to threaten, all the more we need better health management practices. And one of the trends is to use sensor devices. So directly from the, say, RFID chip, we can know the temperature of the animal. We can be given early warning about any fever or any uh, irregularities, uh, heartbeat or whatnot. Uh, this is already being done, even in Asia. And as I mentioned, going down the supply chain, given the consumer's increased uh, preference for safe food, they also want to know who is uh, farming the food that they're eating. So for example, in Korea right now, you can find out through the serial number of the egg exactly which uh, farm or even which hen produced which egg that you consume for that day. You just need to save the eggshell. So that kind of high degree of traceability before we can only dream about it. But with today's digital technologies, this has become increasingly a reality and increasingly affordable, even for our small farmers and even for small enterprises throughout the supply chain. E-commerce is also a very popular uh, trans, uh, type of transaction. The days of um, have the farmer having to show uh, and deliver their, their um, produce to market, that's still very popular these days. But increasingly, farmers are exploring the ability to market through electronic platforms. So they will receive the order online and they might even contact online a logistics provider to pick up the, the produce that is from their farm to be delivered direct to the consumer. This before was uh, only a dream, but is now increasingly becoming a reality, not only for your deliveries of food, uh, but also for even uh, for restaurants, and for other, even factories are exploring these types of options, opening up new market opportunities for farmers. Now, of course, every technology needs somebody to adopt it. And adoption is in our framework for analysis based on a rational choice. It's a comparison of the benefits and costs to the user of that technology so the new technology might involve more costs, at the very least, more equipment, right? When you decide to say, uh, to upgrade your mobile phone to the latest model, there's a cost there. But then you weigh it against what? The benefit of this latest model. So in the case of smart agriculture, what are the benefits? As mentioned, uh, say in the video and uh, it passed parts of my talk, savings on inputs. So instead of uh, delivering so much chemical and spraying it on places not needed, we can avoid that, keep it from flowing out into the environment, just targeting where it is needed. Similarly, similarly for fertilizer, instead of you know spreading it all over and then it gets wasted in runoff, you have a more precise uh, and targeted mechanism for delivering it to the roots of the plants. And all of these other benefits, including lower cost of labor, reducing your need for, to hire more labor, uh, reducing the risk uh, by, say, having better uh, varieties produced with newer biotechnologies that are more robust to uh, plant diseases. And therefore, all of these things, including having outputs that are certified of better quality, especially for more advanced post-harvest and uh, supply chain uh, um, practices, commanding a higher price because they're certifiably of better quality and more hygienic. So comparing these benefits that hopefully will redound to the farmer in terms of higher price or reduce cost, they will look at cost itself of the technology. The technology itself may require the purchase of a new equipment. It may also require the farmer learn something to be able to use the equipment to and benefit the readings, say, or the results. So if you have a sensor device that can exactly 
find out what pest uh, you are suffering from, you need to know a little bit how to deal with that pest once you identify it. This kind of thing is part of the learning requirement of any technology. All of us are very familiar with this when you're deciding whether to buy the latest uh, earphone or uh, uh, mobile device. You also realize that you have a learning requirement for these technologies. There might also be some recurrent costs aside from the fixed investment outlay. Some of these might require a subscription to a cloud service to go uh, to continue the uh, real-time analysis or delivery of uh, information to your um, uh, smart farming system. So all of these are part of the costs of acquiring and using the new technology. Hopefully, if they're outweighed by the benefits, they will motivate many of our farmers to start adopting them. So this is the same uh, sim simple framework for SAP adoption. Now, the idea is once these new uh, technologies are adopted, because the benefits outweigh the costs, this will pave the way for transformation. We have been talking so far about smart agricultural transformation, but we should also contextualize this in terms of a broader idea of uh, agricultural transformation, such as can be seen from older technologies that were in their day very important and very relevant, such as mechanization, such as irrigation. So uh, such as the discovery of new varieties, such as what we saw during the Green Revolution. These are still very much valid for today, although the frontier now is uh, in this area of smart agricultural transformation. So we look at the general uh, assessment of agricultural transformation in selected countries, but we'll also apply the question of readiness with a specific tool. So the tool is, a, is what we call an SAT readiness assessment tool. And the tool involves analysis based on a set of indicators. The set of indicators are grouped around the following categories, upstream, production, downstream, and enabling factors, together with two aspects, development aspect and digitization aspect. What am I talking about? In the ne next few slides, I'll be giving you an idea of what these indicators are. This assessment tool for a specific assessment of SAT readiness was applied to the following countries, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. We also included Taiwan Republic of China as a model of agriculture, which is already showing many signs of being SAT ready. To give you an idea of these uh, various indicators, I will not be able to analyze them one by one in the interest of time. Uh, definitely, you will see the details of all of these uh, methodology and findings in a series of country papers, including a synthesis paper, to be released by APO this February. But to give you a flavor of uh, what kinds of indicators we're looking at, for the upstream factors, remember I mentioned upstream factors divided into development and digitization. Upstream development factors are, so upstream means related to um, inputs to agriculture. So we're looking at agricultural finance. Is there a law or policy on agricultural finance? If yes, the tendency is that helps the country with its SAT readiness. Is there a high agricultural insurance penetration ratio? That's another indicator. If farmers uh, have insurance, then their perception of risk in agriculture might be lower and that might enable them to be more ready to adopt new technologies such as smart agriculture. So higher agricultural pen insurance penetration ratio means the more SAT ready is that country. And so on and so forth, okay? So higher the share of borrowing smallholders and fishers from formal sources, the more SAT ready. The greater the technician to farmer ratio for public sector, if the figures are available also from the private sector, the more SAT ready. For digitization, the, sh the greater the share of extension personnel who are computer literate, the more SAT ready is uh, that country. So those are some of the indicators for the upstream factors. Moving down the value chain, looking at from inputs to production, we're now looking at regulatory frameworks for seed, agrochemicals, agri-machinery, 
if the country has those frameworks, regulatory frameworks, then those are plus points in its assessment for readiness. If it is more mechanized today, chances are it's more ready to um, adopt even newer versions of, uh, say, automa automated, more automated types of machinery uh, for uh, agricultural cultivation, for example, and so on and so forth. So these are the development-related indicators for the digitization-related uh, indicator under production factor. What is the share of youth in rural employment? The hypothesis is the greater the share of youth in rural employment, these are the young people who are more attuned to be uh, adopting the new technologies. So not to say anything bad about the old people, I'm increasingly moving in that uh, age category myself, but uh, frankly speaking, relative to the young people, yeah, they're much faster, right? We old people, we have to accept that. Next is downstream factors. Uh, the development indicators include existence of a law or policy on food safety. So the existence of that law promotes uh, the adoption of uh, SAT. Uh, on down to the logistics, logistics performance index, for instance, is a calculation, is an index calculated by World Bank uh, for most of the World Bank member countries. Downstream factors for digitization include the existence of a law or a policy on e-commerce, how big is the share of e-commerce in total retail sales and whether that share is increasing uh, and so on. And the last set of indicators relate to enabling factors. How much is the share? So in terms of development, how much is the share of public sector budget for agriculture? The greater the share, the greater the amount that the public sector can spend for promoting smart agricultural technologies. On the digitization side, an example of an enabling factor is whether the disaster risk reduction and management system of the country is increasingly being IT based or is it still largely human based with radio contact and so on. This is the traditional one. We're not saying this is useless. This is very useful. But now there are more sophisticated systems. The, the more the country adopts this, uh, like a remote sensing to um, assess <clears throat> flood damage to agriculture uh, in the case of uh, uh, inclement weather, then we say that the country is more ready to adopt uh, smart agricultural technologies. So after looking at all of these indicators submitted and diligently analyzed by our country uh, experts, we came up with the following findings. Now, obviously, the findings will be very much detailed. So again, I will refer you to the full details. I will just give you an overall summary. First, overall agricultural transformation. Based on productivity trends, here the measure is agricultural output. So how much of your agriculture is produced by GDP divided by the workers in agriculture. We can see that it's been growing for the member countries that were analyzed but it is the highest for Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, the, the, the lowest is Vietnam. So even though the agriculture of Vietnam has been growing, it still has a lot of workers in agriculture. So its productivity, the ratio of output to worker is still relatively low. In recent years, India was behind Pakistan, but because of rapid growth of agriculture there, it has been able to catch up. So among these countries, the countries that have the higher productivity will probably be uh, more advanced in terms of agricultural transformation. Other trends in transformation look at the number of agricultural workers per unit of land. So again, uh, the greater is the ratio of workers per unit of land, perhaps the less susceptible they are to um, adopt the smart agricultural technologies. But the lower the number is, then the more prone they are because, because land is becoming scarce, right? As this ratio goes down, the land is becoming scarce. And if you look at the ratios and trends over time, indeed, that ratio has tended to be declining in terms of the number of uh, agricultural workers per unit of land. So this is an additional push towards adopting these uh, smart technologies towards agricultural transformation. So even though there are some positive trends, we saw the productivity, we saw the land per worker, agricultural transformation is still uh, very far no? in terms of, say, the overall transformation of the economy. 
If you look at the comparison of agricultural productivity in agriculture versus agricultural productivity outside of agriculture, namely in industry, we can see an enormous disparity. So in um, India, for instance, only the, the output per worker in agriculture is a little more than one fourth, one fourth of the, another worker working in industry on average. Only 24% for Indonesia. The only countries where the ratio is a little bit high is Malaysia and Cambodia. Philippines, the productivity of the average agricultural worker is about half their industry counterpart. So still there is a big room for agricultural productivity to grow throughout uh, developing Asia. All right, so those are the general assessment. Remember a while ago I said, there's a general assessment, there's specific assessment. Now we look at specific assessment. We, I'll break down the presentation of the findings in terms of the various phases of the agricultural value chain. We start with upstream, no, at the input side. So when we look at the indicators of the countries under the assessment exercise, we find varying degrees or mixed reading on the degree of readiness at the upstream stage. If we look at Thailand, for instance, it will have more indicators rated on the high and medium end. Remember, there are a large number of indicators. Thailand tends to be on the high medium end, but a country like Indonesia will be on the medium to low end. For production factors, so moving now to the next, for most of the countries we saw, they're still at the low medium range. So which means this is not very conducive uh, in terms of their SAT readiness. Some of the countries, though, do score high because they already have some regulatory frameworks that are conducive towards smart agricultural transformation, such as regulatory framework for seed, regulatory framework for agricultural machinery, and so on. Moving further along the value chain to the downstream part. So again, there's a variety of uh, findings for a country like Thailand, they will tend to be on the high range. So for their marketing system, logistics, uh, infrastructure, they tend to score on the high end. But a country like India will tend to score mostly on the medium to low end. You know? So again, this is just overall summary. I'm not saying that India has no high. I'm not saying that Thailand has no low, but this is a general tendency. The last set of indicators are enabling indicators. So for enabling factors for development and digitization, the countries score mostly low and medium, uh, especially for India. For Thailand, that's the other opposite. They tend to score in the medium high. Vietnam and Indonesia are in between these two countries. So uh, they're sort of intermediate between the low to medium of India and the medium high readiness for Thailand in terms of the enabling factors. So far, I have not mentioned Republic of China. We mentioned that as a special case because we can already include that there, by many indicators, they're already SAT ready, but we actually also um, looked at them in terms of uh, as a model for the rest of developing Asia. So for Taiwan, we had found that the enabling factors are mostly present with the exception of uh, the human resources in agriculture. So. Uh, the, the, the human resources are mostly aging, they're well-educated, but they tend to be on the older side compared to workers in industry and services. Farms are also tend to be very small and fragmented in Taiwan. So even though there is a uh, ongoing process of smart transformation in Taiwan, the uptake of these new technologies tends to be slow. So the only way, according to our country expert for Taiwan, for this to be accelerated is the heavy government investment for towards smart agricultural transformation. All right. So I think I covered quite a lot. Let me summarize. Asian agriculture, which is in need of uh, new technologies because of the arguments already made about res being resource scarce, meeting bigger and bigger food demand and more quality food, is already transformed in the past by conventional machine and biological technologies and stands at the cusp of adopting new wave of smart agricultural technologies. However, 
Part of our assessment of the readiness looked at the structure of smallholder agriculture. It's still very widespread throughout uh, developing Asia. So that is part of the factor that will slow down the uptake of these smart technologies. Simply put, a lot of our small farmers cannot afford or feel that they cannot afford uh, adopting these new technologies. Among the technologies that the small farmers can afford tend to be those that are small scale. So rather than drip irrigation uh, that tends to require a large capital investment, the, uh, the putting of a sensor, simple sensor no, that will communicate with your mobile phone. And the mobile phone is a simple, inexpensive smartphone. That's, uh, that one has a greater promise of early adoption. E-commerce as well. There are many examples. India is actually quite famous for many of its farmers uh, who are going big into e-commerce. Uh, throughout Asia, actually, uh, another big example, although it was not covered in this study, is China, let alone the more uh, um, advanced or richer countries of Korea and Japan. We also found in our assessment that governments are indeed preparing their respective agricultural sectors for smart agricultural transformation. They're making various policy statements. They're setting up legal frameworks. Despite this and all of their policy statements, there are still significant constraints in terms of public investments, not just in the SAT itself, but also in its enabling factors, as I mentioned such as logistics and its related infrastructure, such as in agricultural research in, and development, as well as in an extension system. Remember, in many of these countries, extension to small farmers are often public sector employees, but many of them are still doing the traditional kind of extension work involving face-to-face. -face. Again, this is important, but these days there are tools that can now vastly multiply their presence among farmers. But this kind of uh, IT-enabled extension is still fairly weak throughout uh, developing Asia. I did mention Taiwan as a special case. This is a case for a country that basically is spending its way towards smart agricultural transformation. It's very well funded. And because of this funding, it is able to transcend many of the constraints. However, this may not be a model for other countries of developing Asia who do not have uh, that similar endowment of funding for uh, smart agricultural transformation. So to again, summarize the summary, we found varying degrees and aspects of readiness. We cannot just say, oh, this country is ready. This country is not ready. No, we're just saying that this country is showing various indicators that it is ready in these aspects, but maybe not in others. All right. So that is the main value that we derive from this study and not simply saying one zero no uh, this country is ready this country is not ready we're a bit the, the the analysis is a bit more sophisticated than that nonetheless despite all of its complexity we may distill the following recommendations first we find that the pursuit of smart agricultural technology is complementary to policies towards sustainable agriculture and mitigation of climate change so the more countries push so even though they're not pushing hard for smart agricultural transformation, as long as they push hard for sustainable agriculture and mitigation of climate change, uh, reducing the, the ecological footprint of agriculture and so on, the more they will search for methodologies and techniques and practices that will you know, enable these uh, goals to be met, then they will be more ready for smart agricultural technologies. Smallholders, are at a disadvantage in adoption of SAT, especially at the production stage. But one way to remedy this is to have them organized better. So by organizing, they can share in some of the cost of uh, acquiring some of these technologies. By sharing, they'll be able to gain access, but by, sorry, by organizing, they'll be able to gain access to more credit. And perhaps uh, government will be able to better deliver to them insurance, to reduce the agricultural risk and make them more open to the adoption of smart agriculture. Which brings us to government. Government will continue, if they want to accelerate smart agricultural transformation, they must continue to invest, not just in the sophisticated elements, you know, more drones, et cetera, demonstrate all of these things, but also go back to the basics. 
simply putting a farm to market road, fixing it, making it better is actually simultaneously a factor for both conventional agriculture and accelerated smart agricultural transformation. The better your logistics, the more sense it makes for farmers to adopt e-commerce, right? So that's an example of all of these things, no? As well as research and development. So for, say, the extension system to be readily able to deliver new products and services to farmers, there has got to be an active R&D to generate these new technologies. Aside from these hardwares, these roads, these logistics, Ultimately, it's investment in human resources, in the rural workforce, in the uh, computer literacy and the openness to new techniques of uh, our farmers and fisher folk. That is ultimately the key towards smart agricultural transformation. And finally, government can help push it by leading by example. Its systems of governance should increasingly shift towards e-systems. No? Especially now, given this current COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the governments that had advanced more in terms of e-governance, they tended to deliver better services, no? less disrupted uh, if they're able to deliver more services online compared to those that still relied on paperwork, bureaucracy, and face-to-face -face transaction. As well, the extension system of these countries have to start moving in a big way. That's a big leadership by example. When, when the private sector sees that their government is investing in a big way in electronic systems and extension, they will also probably be inspired to also upgrade their system of engagement of farmers who still, you know, even though they're big private sector businesses, they still need to engage smallholders throughout their supply chains. So I tried to compress the findings of a very rich you know, uh, multi-country study in this brief remarks. So hopefully I did distill the essence, but perhaps I missed some. You probably have some questions. So here we open this part of the P talk now to those questions. I'm very interested and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoel, for your wonderful and detailed presentation. And I'm really impressed to know your findings on the research of APO member economies, uh, smart agriculture technologies readiness and their needs for digital transformation in agriculture. It was really an uh, eye-opening session to learn the current status of APO member countries like uh, India, Pakistan, and Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and also by referring uh, Taiwan as a standard because they already adopted a lot of uh, SAT technologies. And uh, you, you also nicely explained the SAT framework, <laughs> adoption factors, and methods for assessing readiness and indicators. Yes, I agree with one of your points. Of course, you have list, listed your recommendations um, uh, to just point out one, um, one uh, point which you made it that the small scale farmers are not able to adopt uh, due to the affordability issue. And that needs to be changed, actually, even though the government is um, ready to shift like e-governance, other technology. But when the farmers are not able to afford for the technologies in place, definitely the government should also involve uh, in customization of those technologies so that the farmers can adopt. I think the, that point also is uh, very important. And um, yeah, then only I believe that because uh, most of our Asian farmers are small scale farmers, they need to, when they need to ready for adoption of these smart, like uh, smart agriculture technologies, uh, definitely the affordability and the customization is a kind of a very important factor we need to consider for 100% agriculture transformation. And uh, thanks again for sharing your um, thoughts and research finding with us. And now we open the floor uh, uh, for the questions. And uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from our audience. And um, uh, let me start, start with uh, Mr. Malok from Malaysia. Yeah, uh, how do we get to the small scale farmers uh, on board? for this kind of a uh, smart agriculture initiatives. That's very important uh, point, I believe, because um, 
I, I believe th th there was another question as well, uh, especially for like in Philippines, uh, like a lot of uh, plantations companies like a uh, Dole, uh, they could adopt this kind of a uh, technology very like uh, progressively. But in case um, when we uh, think about the small scale farmers, how do we get those in board in changing or adopting this? I think that's a uh, question from. Uh, Mr. Malok, and also from Christopher Prayer from Philippines. Could you please answer that? As I mentioned a while ago, no, uh, the smart agriculture covers a wide range of technologies. Some technologies may not be something small farmers are ready to handle, such as, say, expensive drip irrigation systems. But there are other technologies like uh, the use of these, for instance, uh, give you a specific case of Philippines. There's a, uh, the International Rice Research Institute together with the Department of Agriculture is innovating the rice crop manager that gives sort of scientific advice in real time to farmers. So this is something that farmers can readily adopt. They just need uh, being able to access and even now through data services, mobile phone, uh, there's nothing that will stop uh, farmers from being able to make use of this example of smart agriculture and not have to wait uh, a month, two months for the extension officer to come and test their soil and uh, give them advice on the right fertilizer regime, given their, their crop choice. Now, uh, just to give you an example of reality, a reality check, it turns out that many of these farmers, despite the use of rice crop manager, they still need the technician to personally visit them. <laughs> and then help them to fill up all of the data in the app. And then the app will give the farmer the advice. So there's still the role or the helping hand of the technician. And hopefully it is hoped that in the future, once they're introduced to this new method, the technician can, can spare his or her time <clears throat> and to serve the other underreached farmers uh, for other projects and leave the smart tool to support the farmers who have already become uh, familiar with the new technology. So again, there are bits and pieces. Uh, one more, if I may insert this answer, is some farmers may, may be able to collaborate. So if there's a smart, smarter pest management system being offered by uh, a service provider that makes use of drones and other uh, uh, automated uh, uh, scientific uh, system for pest control, uh, instead of one farmer availing of the service, it could be a group of farmers <clears throat> in a contiguous area. They agree that they will share this and subscribe to this service. And then together they will uh, collect the payment and uh, the service provider can help this group of farmers, say, organize in cooperative. So there are solutions like this for aspects of smart agricultural technologies. And I am optimistic that we will see more and more of this in the years to come. Thank you, Dr. Royal. I think uh, that's very valid and uh, important point that you uh, pointed out that uh, when we farmers not affordable in situation, when they form a cluster or a group of farmers so that uh, they can um, uh, get that solution from the providers. I think that's uh, more uh, like an optimistic way. I think a few countries already started to um, approach uh, this kind of uh, method. I believe that in the years to come, I think uh, this is going to be a very successful in adopting the high tech, high tech technologies and make it uh, affordable for the small scale farmers, I believe. Thank, thanks for your um, point on that. And now we have another question from uh, Dr. Shaikh Tanvir Uzain. And uh, yes, uh, his point is, uh, uh, what is your kind of importance or opinion on the importance of public-private partnership for the improvement of SAT readiness? It is very important, you know, uh, especially if the private sector want to reach out to the small farmer, they really need government help. It's difficult for them to look for these farmers and get proper cooperation. But if the local officials and national government uh, support uh, will really cooperate with them, uh, that will be a re really accelerate the process. They can also provide other support that the private sector needs, such as provision of uh, insurance that will uh, help the farmer ease their mind about the risk they're facing. 
Uh, provision of credit, again, uh, the, the government can help broker, either provide the funds directly or if it's not feasible, broker the farmer group to a, to a credit service provider so that they can make use of uh, uh, new technologies that could also be rolled out and uh, favored by the, uh, the private sector to be used by this group of farmers. For instance, the private sector may want to say, you need better water management of your coffee plantations. Here is the new technology. We will actually demonstrate for you the new technology. But then rolling it out to 40,000 farmers might be a challenge for even a big company such as, uh, if I may mention, Nestle, which is active in this uh, regard. So here comes the government uh, that, that can help step in and promote this kind of technology through various means to the farmers, especially those, those groups that exhibit readiness. So I find it absolutely important, the, the greater the cooperation between these two, uh, the more accelerated you will see trends for this SAT. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Royal, for your um, great explanation on uh, Dr. Saik's um, um, questions. And now we have another question from uh, Rohel Mary Sese from, I believe, uh, the audience from uh, Philippines, if I'm right. So uh, the question follows that given the need of connectivity to access SAT and engage in e-commerce, how do you propose to address the digital divide in rural farmers who do have internet access and averse to new technology? I think it's a very, very important question. So how do you answer Dr. Royal on that? So I, I think he means who do not have internet access. This is very true, uh, especially if we look at farmers in Philippines. So let's address first the internet access. So traditionally, we want a more uh, affordable option of um, uh, through the backbone and promotion of uh, Wi-Fi services and uh, uh, optic fiber networks and so forth. This in the long run uh, is what is needed. In the short run, perhaps the data services through radio signals transmitted by the uh, cellular phone towers, that could be the starting point for bridging the digital divide. But this is a high cost solution, right? Ultimately, you want something that is a more uh, physical hardware based, but we can take this one at a time. Uh, there's also the problem that if you rely entirely on private sector, uh, they may not push for the more physical based system, right? Because it actually competes with their data provision service. So again, there's role of government to give the push either to make the investment themselves or to mandate uh, increasing the spread of uh, 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 internet provision, internet uh, provided services. Uh, in more remote rural areas. The other side is willingness. So the aversion to new technologies, this is also very clear. I gave you the example of the farmers who despite everything that they already have on their phone and the technician still has to be the one uh, to, to en enter the data for them. Uh, the hope is the young people in their household, <laughs> frankly put, this is the reality in Philippines. The young people in their household, they're the ones who are more open. If we can reach the young people in their household and uh, by reaching these young people, and they will be interested, right? Because they're usually interested in these high-tech applications. Then suddenly they're surprised. Or it, it's, it, you can use it also for my father's livelihood or my grandfather's livelihood. That could really engage them. Once you penetrate the young people, hopefully the entire household will be encouraged, especially if they see the beneficial results from uh, these uh, new technologies, adopting the new systems, and so on. So through working with young people, well, unfortunately, a lot of young people are being discouraged to work in agriculture. This is a trend throughout Asia. But if you can encourage young people by showing that agriculture can also be uh, modernized with these uh, smart applications, then yes, there, there is a hope to be able to bridge this uh, gap of willingness of many of our farmers. Thank you, Dr. Royal, um, for your great explanation. I think uh, I agree your point that, uh, uh, you know, recently uh, in most of the countries, Asia, for, like youth, they are going away from agriculture because of urbanization. They try to go and live in urban like life with a sophisticated, luxurious life. But, uh, you know, this is a kind of a challenging in 
all Asian countries where, especially if you see country like Japan and um, like uh, Korea, Taiwan, where you have a lot of um, uh, like adult, like a uh, elder populations, they don't have a, like a future generations to look after. Again, this connects to, because the, we have a, a continued chain of problems um, uh, to considering for uh, the future generations. I think uh, if we have this kind of uh, technologies in place and uh, maybe that could be a kind of uh, entrance or you can attract those youths so um, uh, they can come back and uh, um, uh, do the farming with the all uh, modern technologies because the elder population is unable to adopt those technologies even though it is in place. I think uh, the, that uh, paradigm shift should take place in the coming years, I believe. And uh, yes, we have um, a line of questions. And uh, I will take a question from, uh, again, Philippine, I believe, Mo Lourdes Mendoza. Uh, the question follows, how can an accurate and updated registry of small farmers with more data on their needs and challenges help in affecting agriculture transformation and productivity. What's your opinion on that, Dr. Rowell? So this is really to support uh, public sector service delivery, right? Because uh, a lot of the programs of government are directed towards small farmers, but then how can they deliver their services if they don't know who the small farmers are? Now there are traditional systems of uh, small farmer where you know, the, the agricultural agency simply has a list somewhere in the drawer, filed, filed somewhere in the drawer. But again, there's a way of making this more systematic, digitally based, uh, digitally captured. So the better you can have this, the greater the cooperation across various agencies can be secured. So in one shot, if you have a good registry uh, with, with all of the validations, biometric capture, if it can be keyed into their other uh, identifiers, that could help them gain access to credit, right? So uh, the, the bank no longer needs to verify, does this person really exist? If, it, if the person is on the registry, uh, the registry is reliable, certified by government, then they know that this person exists, then they can look at their other uh, records. So the, that registry system is really the starting point to be able to systematically deliver services in a targeted and convergent way. Now, of course, that carries a risk. Let's not discount that if this information is shared too often, it could be prone to identity theft and all kinds of uh, other abuses. So uh, I'm sure right now throughout the world, there is this uh, discussion ongoing about uh, how to make sure that despite more and more data capture at the individual level, we still safeguard the data so that person is still secure in their privacy. Only the, they share the data only exactly for the purpose. Uh, that they need, say, for the delivery of the exact service that, that they're expecting. So I think the benefits outweigh the cost uh, of uh, having this uh, kind of re registry, especially one that is digitally captured and enabled. And again, this is part, actually, of this uh, smart transformation, not just in agriculture, but uh, in all kinds of uh, government programs. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Royal. And uh, we have our... Uh, Another question uh, from uh, India, uh, Mr. Kicha. And the question follows like the small farmers are more in many developing countries who cannot afford new technologies. And do you suggest any cooperative model or group model to share and use these new technologies or equipments? Yes, yeah, so What's your um, I think I already mentioned an example. So. To roll out this, uh, say, a um, well, I'm not the, the specific example I know is not really smart, but it could become smart. A drip irrigation system for farmers. It was very difficult for an individual farmer uh, to set it up, but there was a group of them, and they they were on a contiguous plots, and they shared the system. And as a group, they transacted with support of government and the private sector uh, to be able to finance the acquisition and uh, at least on a portion of their plot on a contiguous set of area to be able to uh, introduce that kind of system. I believe this is a model because later on such kind of system 
from a human monitored, they can be increasingly shifted towards a digital system if their cooperation worked uh, for, for that regard. Uh, then then uh, the cooperation can work even for more advanced versions of that technology. Now, that's a kind of a big, large-scale investment that could possibly be shared across a group of farmers. Other, other pieces of uh, um, uh, technologies may not require uh, large-scale investments. It could be as simple as a, an upgraded version of a mobile phone that can run a particular app for doing uh, sensor-based analysis or purchase of uh, actual uh, equipment for uh, sensor-based analysis of the farm. This could be done at the level of individual farmers. However, they need to be convinced. So they need, this is not just uh, unique to smart agriculture, but actually new technologies, even rolling out a new seed, right? They, the farmer want to see that this new seed will actually work in their neighbor's field. And if it works and it makes more money for them, definitely I, I guarantee that they will be interested in adopting. They just need to see the value of this uh, new, new technology. Yes, um, I very well agree on that because uh, farmers, they are always a little bit reluctant to, because you need to invest the money for such kind of tech. So if they like seeing is believing, if your neighbor farmers is like getting a positive benefit out of that by using any kind of new technology, definitely uh, there will be a line of farmers to follow those kind of technologies. And there, I think uh, here is, uh, sometimes the uh, NGOs or the like um, you know, government organizations or the uh, or cooperatives needs to step in just to show as a demonstration of uh, so like uh, we can see early adopters or progressive farmers who are actually ready to afford for any kind of new technology so we can use them as a model or demonstration players so that our low uh, small scale farmers can just follow it up and uh, try it in, into their own farms to get benefit out of it i uh, very well agreed on your point uh, dr rohel and um, i have a couple of questions as well and uh, uh, during your presentations, one of your slides, you mentioned that there is a large gap remains uh, between productivity in agriculture and productivity outside. And by adopting latest innovations, it could be solved. Uh, I'm trying to understand. So, uh, well, could you please give more examples on what technologies front it could be minimized. I, I know you, you, there are a lot of technologies are in place, but could you specific some technologies so that it could minimize the gap? So this is uh, not really a new finding. It is something that uh, many historians and economists have uh, seen in the course of agricultural development, that as an economy grows and per, an economy becomes richer, the the, the, the total of the, the um, where was I? As the economy becomes richer, there's a tendency for the structure of the economy to change. So the, uh, the farming population leaves, but however, even though the farming population leaves, the level of agricultural output continues to go up. So how is this possible? This was through the adoption of labor saving technologies. So. Uh, this new type of smart agricultural transformation will save all kinds of inputs, fertilizers, water, and actually including labor. So if your measurement of productivity is output per worker, what's going to happen is as ag agriculture transforms, increasingly labor saving will happen. So for instance, in the case of uh, farming, say rice farming, this is a, a huge amount of labor was for weeding. But later there was an invention of a conventional chemical that actually saved a lot of labor cost by simply spraying the herbicide. Uh, that was a part of say in, uh, uh, agriculture 3.0, for instance. But now with agriculture 4.0, uh, industry 4.0 for agriculture, we might even be able to dispense with the herbicide, the toxic herbicide, and apply uh, other, other solutions to deal with weeds and still save on the labor cost. So this is part of this overall trend and definitely, we cannot have the same kind of farming where you have one or two uh, a farmer farming small, tiny plots of land. Uh, it is important that all of these land holdings get consolidated. The inputs being used uh, are, are saved. 
but the, the land is still as productive as before. Can you imagine that? How can we do that? Again, smart agricultural technology is part of the answer. Right. Uh, let us be very optimistic that uh, smart agriculture technology is going to um, uh, like increase the productivity, even though within that uh, same land. I think uh, that's what everyone wants to believe. And uh, with that, and um, I, I can go for one more question on um, government related policies. And uh, uh, how do you think that the specific government policies and programs uh, that facilitates the adoption of these digital technologies in you can take it as an agriculture and also food sector how it's very uh, or how it's going to play a vital role in adopting these uh, technologies how do you think so so uh, we, the, I, I can divide it into several aspects one is the regulatory framework the regulatory framework should or the policy framework should already anticipate and incorporate so uh, in my country, for instance, several years ago, there was a big um, shift towards e-commerce because the, 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 the tax system said, we are now ready to accept electronic receipts. You don't need paper receipts. So you, because, of course, in an e-commerce system, there are no paper receipts, right? It kind of defeats the purpose. So that was a huge advance. And that definitely, the e-commerce system could not have taken on in the Philippines if the regulation was not made more consistent with the new technology. The acceptance of digital signatures, that's also a very important part of being able to uh, expand you know, the scope of uh, e-commerce system. So that's one example, a regulatory framework that accepts that there are new ways and the old ways of verifying seed varieties and so on uh, might be obsolete, rendered obsolete by the new technologies and therefore the system itself should be more up to date as well as various policy frameworks. So uh, being able to certify that certain new biotechnologies are environmentally safe and safe for people, that's something that also needs to be matched up and not be taken by surprise when there's another new GMO around the corner and then the government doesn't know, oh, let's just ban it, no? Uh, without doing a serious, you know, updated study of the real impact on human health uh, and on the environment. The other aspect is uh, its own systems have to be themselves upgraded. As I said, it, the government should lead by example uh, in these systems. The third is uh, the specific programs where um, the private sector willingness combines with government uh, push towards adoption of new technologies and government can fulfill its role by bringing in smallholder farmers. So, uh, the, the private sector can say, we know the technology, we can bring it in from India, we can bring it in from Israel, say the, the first video again. But we need small farmer cooperators, and it's too expensive for us to look for these small farmers willing. Can you help us? So government steps in. So the, the third aspect is specific program the, for accelerating the adoption of these kinds of technologies in the uh, value chain of agriculture specific to small farmers. Now, of course, if it's not small farmers, government, I think, doesn't need to, to help there. I mean, if it's just the big big farmer and the big agribusiness, they can transact on their own. No problem. You don't, don't need to involve taxpayer dollars for that. But for the smallholder, definitely, we don't want them left behind of all of these advances. All the more urgently, we want groups and cooperatives of these smallholders to participate actively in these new technologies. That's absolutely very well agreed, uh, Dr. Royal. I think um, the government plays a very, very important critical role in bringing those kind of uh, cooperatives so that uh, that small, uh, whatever the new technologies uh, private players are bringing in, but government needs to step in to uh, take those technologies to the small scale farmers. So government policies plays a vital role. And um, yes, now our time has come up. So uh, uh, I will just ask the final questions. That would be your um, summary of a key takeaway message for our viewers. How, what kind of message are you going to give for our viewers today? Well, the future is already happening now. And if we imagine an amazing future with self-driving cars and all that, that's also true for agriculture. The, and that future is already happening. 
the urgent thing is uh, it's not just a future for the richer folk. It's also a future for our small farmers. Uh, we have to enjoy not only cheaper food, better food, but also a kind of uh, food system where they also benefit from all of the wonderful things that we are reaping from this modernizing and advancing agri-food system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Royal, for your valuable insights. And I believe all of our viewers found your information and insights very useful. Um, in the interest of uh, our time, um, dear viewers, uh, we are unable to take all your questions. I would request to post your questions in the comment section, and uh, we will get back those answers with after discussing with Dr. Royal in the comment box. And uh, yes, it's time to end up. And wow. the APO Productivity Talk will be held every Tuesday and Thursday, featuring world-leading experts. So please subscribe this APO channel and stay tuned. Goodbye. Thank you and goodbye.